Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now Ministries. We are a ministry with a heart to see awakening in America. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge. What words do you most frequently use to describe a follower of Jesus? If we uh, listen to conversation among people who claim to be his followers, there are certain words that come up, words like churchgoer, words like a member, church member, I'm a member of such and such church. And words like Christian. It's fascinating to examine those words that we use so frequently and to compare them with the number of times they're used in the Bible. The words that we so frequently use, Christian or Christians, I don't know how often that word is used in the entire New Testament. A grand total of three times. Twice in the book of Acts, and once in First Peter. And from all that we can tell, the word was not invented by us. It was a derogatory term invented by the opponents of Jesus. It was a way of making fun of those who followed him. We've embraced the term, but you only find it three times in the Bible. How about the word churchgoer? Big goose egg. And it's just not there. But you know the word that appears over and over again? It's disciple. Over 250 times. This week, as the Lord said, this is the direction we need to go today. One of the things he said is, read through the whole New Testament and find every instance where the word disciple is used. And here are some of the things that I saw. I saw, first of all, that we usually use that word to refer to the 12, don't we? The New Testament uses the word that way too. There are many times when it's talking about Jesus' 12 disciples. There are other times, however, when it's talking about far more. Let me give you an example. This is in Luke chapter 6. Beginning in verse 12, it says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated apostles. And then verse 17, he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there. When we read the New Testament, one of the things that we see is all followers of Jesus are called disciples. And when you look in the book of Acts, you see Acts chapter 6, for instance, as the number of disciples was growing rapidly, we are told, As we look through the New Testament, disciple is the Bible's favorite word for a follower of Jesus. More importantly, disciple is Jesus' favorite word for his followers. It's not just that the word is used frequently, it's the word that Jesus uses to call his own. In the Greek New Testament, the word is methetes. It means a learner. One who learns from a teacher. But that is often where many students of Scripture stop. And frankly, the truth is far richer. Because you see, this word that the Greek New Testament uses to describe Jesus' followers is a way of speaking of a word used in the Hebrew Bible. First Chronicles chapter 25. It is Talmud in Hebrew a learner, a student. And it is so important for us to understand what that meant in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, he would have called his followers in Hebrew, Talmudim. And here's what that means. During the time of our Lord Jesus Christ was a unique window in the history of God's people. Because for a limited period of time, not just Jesus, but many others practiced gathering disciples around them. Talmudim, they are called in Hebrew. A Talmud is one of them. Talmudim is plural. Lots of them. We're told in the New Testament the disciples followed Jesus everywhere. We're told that the Pharisees had disciples. Many of the Religious leaders said, we are disciples of Moses. John the Baptist had disciples. 
Jesus did what others were doing. And I believe there's a reason for that because it is so significant. You see, in Jesus' day, a rabbi gathered disciples around himself. Most rabbis chose just the ones who came and applied and they weeded out the others. Jesus called all to be his disciples, all to be his Talmudim. And here is what that meant. This is what we know from the New Testament as well as from the writings of the great Jewish scholars. A rabbi and his Talmudim were noted for the following things. I'm going to list five of the most important. Surrender, internalize, accept, imitate, reproduce. Please notice, every one of those words is a verb. It's an action word. And here is what it means. A rabbi who called his disciples to him demanded the following of them. Number one, absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. Everything else in life was placed in second place for the supreme joy of being with the rabbi wherever he went. In Jesus' day, the rabbi was not yet an occupation. It was not a, a, a title for a particular office. It was simply a recognition that you are my leader and I will go wherever you take me. And as a result, disciples surrendered themselves to their rabbi. That is exactly what Jesus calls you and me to do to surrender ourselves to him. Now, I realize surrender sounds scary, doesn't it? We like to be in, well, let me just put this in first person singular. I like to be in control. That's my nature. And what Jesus says is surrender. Surrender to me. And surrendering to him, while it may sound scary, it is the pathway to ultimate joy and purpose. Here's the way Jesus put it. Listen to these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is saying is not we're supposed to hate our loved ones. What he is saying is our loyalty to him is to rise above every other human affection. He loves us unconditionally. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, he declares. And he calls us now to place everything in second place. And he is to be preeminent in all things. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now, Jesus is not saying, hate your brother and sister. He's not saying, hate your wife or hate your husband. What he's saying is, compared to the love that we have for him and the commitment to him, everything else fades by the wayside. Because it's only as our lives are anchored in him that we can truly love others. I mean, he tells us to love our enemies. (laughs) And that comes out of a heart that is surrendered to him. That is what it means to be a disciple, to surrender. There's a second truth the New Testament lays out. And it is also reflected in what we know of the rabbis of Jesus' day and especially Jesus himself. And that is internalize. A disciple was expected to internalize his rabbi's teaching. In fact, in a world where writing was difficult and printing press had not been invented, disciples actually memorized what their rabbi taught and said. They committed those things to memory. They internalized them. It's what Jesus means when he says in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. It says, to the Jewish people who had believed in his name, he said, 
If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. A disciple was expected to internalize the teaching of his rabbi or her rabbi. A disciple takes his word in, internalizes it. And what that's saying to you and me, in a world where we are bombarded with so much questionable material and frankly so much perverse material, Jesus' disciples are called to take his word in and allow that word to shape and guide us Because if we depend on our own instincts, let's be real honest, we're going to mess up. It's just that simple. We live in a fallen world. We are fallen people. We need our Messiah, our Rabbi, Jesus, to instruct and inform us. There's a third thing that we see in the New Testament, that we see in the teachings of Jesus, and that we see in the day where Jesus lived. And that is accept. Accept. Disciples were expected to accept the way their teacher understood the Bible. Rabbis taught their students how to understand the Scriptures and apply the Scriptures to life. And you and I are called to understand the Scriptures not in light of what may be popular today, but rather... How does Jesus understand the scriptures? Listen to these words. John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus said, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Jesus is saying, He is the one to whom the Scriptures point. He is the hope of the nations, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. And our understanding of the Scriptures is to be based not on what seems appropriate to us at the moment, but rather on what Jesus Himself has declared and shown and fulfilled. Disciples accept what their teacher has taught them. And more than that, disciples imitate. We are called to imitate our teacher. Now don't get me wrong. Jesus is perfect. You and I are not. But we are to reflect him more and more in our lives. That is what a disciple does. And again, that too is the clear teaching of the Bible. Jesus taught that to his disciples and made it very clear. Listen again to these words. As we read in the scriptures, Luke chapter 6, verse 40. The student, and the word that's translated student here is mathetes, disciple. The disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. We are to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is his desire for all of his disciples, that we imitate him. That as he has been so incredibly gracious, so also we are gracious. As he turns the other cheek, so we turn the other cheek. As he goes the way of the cross, we follow the way of the cross because we want to be like him. And finally, Disciples reproduce. That's the way the Gospel of Matthew ends. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what it means to be a disciple. And that's what Jesus desires for you and for me. And I know that hearing that can sometimes lead to all sorts of guilt feelings. Let's be honest. We hear those words, we see what the Scripture says, and we think, oh man, I have fallen so far short, Lord. 
And that's where good news comes. Jesus didn't say, once you get your act together, you'll be my disciples. Jesus did not say, okay, do your spiritual push-ups, and once we see that you've got spiritual muscle, then you can follow me. No, Jesus called broken people, and he simply said, I love you, now follow me. And you know, when somebody loves you enough that they're willing to die for you, it is not a problem to follow. When someone loves you so much that they pull you out of the ash heap and restore you, it is not a pain to follow. When someone breaks into your life and heals the deepest of wounds, it is not a difficulty to have to follow. Jesus invites broken, sinful, wounded people to be his followers. He calls fishermen who when they saw him doing his mighty works, Peter fell on his knees and said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Jesus says, you follow me and I'm going to make you a real fisherman, a fisher of men. He called a woman who was inhabited by seven demons, a broken, broken and tortured soul. And he called her to follow him, and she became the first eyewitness to his resurrection. Her name was Mary Magdalene, and she is one of his disciples. You see, God is not saying, you lousy sinner, get your act together. God is saying, I love you, and I am going to transform you because I love you so much. Follow me, and what a difference that makes. This past week, a friend of mine forwarded me a a, a testimony from Ravi Zacharias. Here's the story. Ravi Zacharias talks about the first time he went to Vietnam in 1971. He was in his mid-20s at the time, and he had an interpreter with him, a young Vietnamese teenager, 17 years old, named Hien. They got along fairly well. And then Rabbi Zacharias was gone, and he never saw Hien again until 17 years later. And in 1988, Rabbi Zacharias, meeting Hien for the first time in 17 years, Hien was twice the age that Rabbi had known him. And Rabbi said, Hien, what's been going on in your walk with God? And Hien said, Oh, Rabbi. You can't imagine what has happened to me. He said, after you left, and after the Americans left, I was arrested because I had been translating for missionaries, and I was a Christian, and I had translated for American soldiers. And so they threw me into prison. And for a year and a half, they tortured me mentally. They forced me to read the writings of Marx and Engels. He said, I came to a point where I was just simply unable to go any further, Ravi. And so, one night, I said, that's it. I am no longer going to follow God. I'm going to go off on my own and make it for myself. And the next morning, he woke up and for the first time, he did not begin his day with prayer. The commandant of the camp came to him. And on the day he had chosen to reject God, he said, I want you to go clean up the latrine. He then said it was the foulest thing he had ever experienced. He said just the smell was nauseating enough. He could barely hold it together. And as he was cleaning up everything and was forced to take a wastebasket full of paper with human excrement on it, He said he could barely keep from gagging and retching when suddenly out of the corner of his eye he noticed that one of those pieces of paper had writing on it. It was English. It was the first time he had seen something in English in months. 
And so when no one was looking, he grabbed that filthy piece of paper, quickly washed it off and stuck it in his pocket. That night, he lay in bed in the barracks of the prison, mosquito netting over him. And when everyone was asleep and the sounds of people snoring hid the sound of his removing that piece of paper, he pulled it out, turned on a flashlight that he had, and this is what he read. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall persecution or danger or nakedness or sword? If God is with us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things with Christ? And he then said, at that moment he just wept and he said, Oh God, you wouldn't even let me go 24 hours without calling me back. You are so good. Do you know what he did the next morning? He went to the commandant and said, I'd like to volunteer to clean the latrine every day. The commandant couldn't believe it, but said, you got it, man. And so he went into the latrine, filthy, smelling. And he looked again in that wastebasket, and here's what he discovered. Years ago, the commandant had been given a New Testament by missionaries. And in Vietnam, which at that time, paper was at a premium. The commandant was using it for toilet paper. Hien was able to collect the entire book of Romans and wash it off and take it back to his barracks. He said many months later, they finally released him. He couldn't wait to get out of Vietnam. And so he got together with a group of other individuals, 53 of them, and began building a boat to escape the country. Just days before they were ready to leave, five Viet Cong came up to him, and they said, are you doing this to flee the country? And he said at that moment, all he could do was lie. He said, no, no, I'm not doing that. None of us are. They looked at him and said, are you sure you're telling the truth? He said, oh yeah, I'm telling the truth. And with that, they walked away. And he said at that moment, the Holy Spirit convicted him. He said, Lord, here I am trying to make my own rules again and do it my way. If they ever come to me again or I'm ever asked that question from now on, Lord, I will tell the truth. Days later, just hours before they were ready to leave the country, the same five Viet Cong came up to Hien and they said, are you building this boat to flee the country? And Hien said, yes, I am. What can you do to me but throw me back in prison? They pulled him away, took him inside to a nearby room, and said, we want to go with you. It turned out these five men were trained sailors. And it was only because they were with Hien and his 53 friends on that boat that they survived the perilous voyage from Vietnam to Thailand. Following Jesus, it is not an easy road. But dear friends, it's the only road that gets you to the destination. Following Jesus does not mean that everything in your life is just going to go hunky-dory and super smooth, but it does mean in the end you will experience in this life as well as the life to come the joy of His presence, the power of His Holy Spirit, and the amazing love of our Heavenly Father. And we just don't want to miss that. In a world and particularly in a nation where many want simply Christianity light. Jesus is calling us to Christianity right. You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. 
Have questions about today's message? Text us at 612-545-5654 or email us at mail at awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.